I'm weak, when you are weak, when we are weak. And an interesting subject, but God just kind of got my, got my attention with a, a couple different scriptures. And uh, so the question I want to address this morning is, how do I get strong in my faith and overcome this self-sufficiency that I deal with, the self-strength that I deal with? Does anybody besides me struggle with being independent and self-sufficient? Anybody? Oh, good. There's a few honest people out there. I appreciate knowing that. Um, and so I want to look at this. How do we really begin to tap into and experience God's strength in our weakness? How do we let ourselves be weak in ourselves and strong in God? So that's what we're going to look at this morning. I love this verse, Isaiah. This is probably a verse that most of us have heard of or read. In Isaiah 40, verses 30 and 31. And by the way, we have a, a, a Calvary app. If you've got your, phone, your iPhone and you have the app downloaded, you can follow along the sermon notes. Or there's 10 copies of it on paper behind Rosie. Raise your hand, Rosie. They're all gone. Okay, we've already passed them out. So... But if you do have the app and you want to get the app and you don't know how to download it, Brooke, would you raise your hand? You can talk to Brooke and she'll show you how to do that. That's the easy way to follow along and the Bible's on it, everything too. So Isaiah 40, verses 30 and 31. Listen to this and think about it. Even youths or young people will become weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. So what does it take for young people, youths, to become exhausted, tired, and weary? Tell me, anybody, what does it take for that to happen? Okay, that's a couple answers. What else? What was that? Taking on too much, yep. Social media. <laughs> That'll wear you out, right? What else? Believing lies. Yeah. So you, when we think of young people, like these two strapping farmers over here in South Africa, Brandon and uh, Vian, they, um, they don't look like they're suffering from being weak physically. But the right circumstances can wear anybody down, can't they? If you hit your head against the wall, beat your head against the wall enough times, no matter how strong you are, you get exhausted. You get weary. Tired. So we're going to talk a little bit about that because God wants us to discover a source of strength that's not based on the physical ability we have, the, the mental ability we have. It comes from trusting Him in new dimensions, new ways. He says that we can soar high on wings like eagles and run and not ever get weary. Wow, I want that. Walk and not faint. You know, we experience a lot of different kinds of weaknesses. They're, of course, physical, you know, like the idea, well, I'm a weakling physically, I don't, I'm not very strong, or my wife is the weaker vessel. We talk about that sometimes. It's not very fair. I'm too young, I'm too old, I'm not strong, those kinds of things. We talk about health, weakness and health, you know, I've got a weak heart. We talk about financial weakness. I had a friend that used to say, I'm so broke I can't pay attention. <laughs> Always made me laugh. Relationally, we can be weak. When we are alone, when our relationships are broken, that's a weakness. And we can also have weakness when we just don't know what we need to know. I remember Brooke and I were in Romania at one point a number of years ago, and we were in, a big, in the city of Bucharest, millions of people, and we couldn't speak the language. 
And we felt so inadequate because we didn't know how to get where we wanted to go. Very few people speak English very well. We were trying to find McDonald's. We found McDonald's. It was like, oh, <laughs> crazy. Did you know they put cucumbers on their Big Macs? Oh, cucumber slice. So this morning, I want you to look at, a cu- get, give it, look at the people right next to you, kind of make a little group there, maybe move next to each other so there's like two or three people at a time or at a table. I'm going to have you guys ask, answer a few questions, okay? So the first one is, tell the person next to you of a time when you felt you were really weak, powerless, or helpless, a circumstance where you were weak, powerless, helpless, okay? Or you were just in a place where you couldn't move. You were just stuck, okay? So we'll give you a moment or two to answer that. Turn to somebody next to you. Give everybody a turn. Okay. The next question is, what did you do? How did God, did God help you or somebody else help you? So answer that. Give you another couple of minutes. Some of you obviously don't have any problems or never had any problems. We've got some quiet people here. <laughs> okay, let's keep going. So I'll just give you one little quick example. Brooke and I Back in about 19, no, about 2001, we bought a, uh, a house for $40,000 in Oregon. And uh, uh, we thought we got a great deal until it rained. And the house is built on the side of a, house, a hill. And so it had a basement that was concrete on half of it. It was split level. And when it rained, the, the bottom of the house flooded. And uh, so we realized we had a problem. And so we had a friend who's a contractor, and we made an arrangement with him. He's a guy at the church. And we jacked, he jacked the house up and tore out that rotten foundation. It turned out it was, they used sand from the ocean, which had salt in it, which didn't work too well for concrete. And they had old model T parts for reinforcing steel and things like that. It's an old house. And uh, so he, our friend Mark got the house all jacked up and demoed, so nothing underneath it. It was just 10 feet of space. And then he was ready to, to put a new foundation in and, and uh, divert all the water so go around it and stuff. And, and he said, now I'm, I'm going to need some money. And so we thought, well, yeah, we'll borrow some money from the bank. So we went to the bank, and they goes, uh, you can't borrow money for a house you've already uh, started the demo on and, and all, all, all already started the project. And uh, <laughs> we went, what? We can't borrow the money? We're more stuck with our house on stilts? And uh, so we went home. We were pretty discouraged, and we, we just said, God, what are we going to do? We're at a place of weakness. We're powerless. The bank said no. And uh, I don't know exactly what happened, but about three or four days later, I think uh, a banker called us and said, you know, I, I, I've reviewed your situation, and I think we can work with you. 
And uh, I don't know what God did, but they changed the banker's heart. Yeah, Brooke, do you remember? Oh, the contractor did. Okay, well, that was wonderful. But God answered a prayer when we were weak. God came through and helped us in a situation like that. So, so in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 32, we read about the story of Jacob wrestling with God. How many of you have read that story at some point in your life? Yeah, many of you had. And uh, Jacob um, is, is the epitome of the independent, self-strong person. He's got everything. He's physically strong. He's mentally really intelligent. He's just a really strong personality. And he's been in a circumstance where he's been being ripped off by his, his uh, father-in-law. And so he leaves with his family and all of his grandkids. And they, they, they sneak out at night and, and, and get way out. And then the, then the father-in-law finds out about it. And he gets all these men together to chase after Jacob. And anyway, in the middle, middle of this story, Jacob is worried about his brother coming too because he's already ripped his brother off. And his brother, he knows, is going to want revenge and probably kill him. And so in the middle of the night, Jacob has sent his family off to face his brother who's coming and all these gifts to hopefully pacify his brother and make peace with him. And in the middle of the night, we read that Jacob wrestles with an angel, the angel of the Lord. And we find out a little bit later that it's the Lord himself. And, and the Lord actually, at a certain point, wrestling with Jacob all through the night, he touches Jacob's thigh and, and, and uh, it causes Jacob to become hurt to be physically, um, I don't know what you'd call it, wounded or something, but he, he has a limp now, and he can't win the wrestling, but he won't let go of God. He won't let go of the Lord. It's a powerful story in Genesis 32. And then through that, the Lord asked Jacob, what do you want, Jacob? And, and, and basically, Jacob says, I want you to bless me. I need you, God. I want you to bless me. And the Lord says, I'm going to change your name. And what that means, I'm going to change your identity, Jacob. You're no longer going to look at yourself as being the guy that, that, that is able to manipulate and use other people to get your way. He changes his name to Israel. Israel is fascinating because the name literally means somebody that has authority with or from God. So God changed Jacob from being self-strong to being God-strong. And he's never the same the rest of his life. When you read that story, look at how that point in his life changed everything. But Jacob's not the only one. We're going to look at Paul in just a second. God says four things to people who are strong in themselves and to people who really in God are, are weak and we need his strength. He says, in, first of all, that it's okay to be weak. And listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12. I have received such wonderful revelations from God that to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan, to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. And each time he said, my grace is sufficient, is all you need is sufficient for you. My power works best in weakness, his weakness. So Paul says, now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work in me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, that really doesn't work well with our modern culture, does it? It seems like a paradox. How can you be strong when you're weak? But Paul also makes it clear that God's strength is not going to be experienced by you and me until we can become weak, until we can lay down our strength. I don't know about you. I think all of us have control issues. I know I do. I do. I struggle with it. But God says it's not until you give up control and allow me to be in charge and me to be strong for you that you're going to experience real strength. 
So Paul, in a sense, had a limp also, that thing called a thorn in the flesh. We're not exactly sure what it was, but uh, it was definitely a, God allowed the enemy, Satan, to do something that was really hurting Paul. And he caused Paul to have to cry out to God and then just trust God to help him in this place of weakness. Some people believe it was a physical affliction, like a health issue. We don't know. So this morning, how about you? Have you experienced a limitation in your life that has caused weakness in you, but it's actually opened a door for you to become stronger in God, stronger in your faith? Think about that. A physical limitation. Anybody know what I'm talking about this morning? Some of us, as we get older, it's just that's a limitation, right? Back problems, foot problems. There's so many problems. Everything goes downhill after 50, right? But God actually, in those limitations, draws us closer to Him, teaches us about a source of strength that we didn't realize was available in Him. Second thing that God says to us is, I've given you my spirit, my Holy Spirit, to strengthen you. In the prophet Zechariah, the Lord said to him, You will not succeed by your own strength or by your own power, but by my spirit, says the Lord all-powerful. God's saying, your own strength isn't going to cut it. It's not going to be enough for you. What you have relied on, your ability to influence, your ability to make things happen, your ability to make people do what you want them to do, it's not going to be enough. God said, it's going to be by my spirit in you that you begin to find a strength that you haven't lived in before. And that that strength is going to be what allows you to really be successful. So, what does it mean to be successful. Why don't you turn to your little group again and th just tell them what you think success means, okay? What is success? What does success look like? The second half of that is, what do you think God believes or means by success? What is God's definition of success? Is it the same as yours? <laughs> of course, there are different kinds of success, different kinds of things. Okay, let's come back together. So I'm curious. I want to have you people throw out a, a definition of success that they tossed around. So, Chris, what was success in your eyes? Wow, figuring out the ways God sees things. God's measure of success. Okay, very good. I like that. How about Brock back there? What's success, Brock? 
Give generously. Ooh, I like that too. That's cool. How about Jeff? What does that mean, Jeff? Being able to help others? Yeah. Katie, what's success? Wow. Ooh, I like that. I like that a lot. Joyce, what do you think success is? To walk in God's steps and follow his calling. Yeah. Brooke, can you add to that? So the Lord says, if we look at that verse again, you're not going to succeed by your own strength, your own power, but you're going to have success by my spirit. And I believe that when our when we align with our goal for success is with God's goal, we're going to see that power of his spirit behind it. It's a really cool verse. We're going to, the third point here is that God says, I've given you a clear roadmap for tapping into my strength. And Isaiah verse 30, 15 talks about this. Verse Isaiah 30, verse 15 says, This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel, says, Only in returning to me and resting in me will you be saved. In quietness and confidence is your strength. Quietness and confidence. Here's a, I was so glad to hear that Zestos decided to closed for the season after the next seven days or whatever it is, and that you made a decision that you needed to have some rest, some quietness and some, com some you know, some returning and rest in the Lord. And I just think that was such a cool thing. I, I certainly want you guys to be blessed financially, but I just thought you're trusting God. You're trusting God, even if it means not going maybe as long as you were hoping to, to be open. And we, we do appreciate Zestos that but I think you took a step towards success in God. I thought that was really cool. So what does this returning and resting, quietness and confidence thing look like? Any ideas? What does it mean to return and rest? I'll throw out some ideas and see if you guys can add to it. Humbling ourselves. First one I have, humbling myself. Saying to God, God, I just want to, I just want to admit to you, I can't do everything. <laughs> I don't have what it takes. I need to trust you. I can't control even the people I love the most in my life. I can't control them. So, Lord, I humble myself and say, Lord, you take over. You help me. It's cultivating a listening heart to listen to God and listen to others. Realizing that I need to know what God wants to do. I can't just keep going in my own understanding. I need to hear Him. So I'm going to find a quiet place. Uh, Bob Brawley, when I brought him home yesterday, from uh, when he came in from the uh, military from uh, Kuwait, um, I picked him up and we had a wonderful time sharing and praying on the way. And uh, Bob said, one of the things I'm wanting the most is just to be able to get away and be alone with the Lord. I think he's going to go out to the box shoot dam or something. And he said, I just need time. He says, I've been in the military for 10 months overseas. I have not been alone at all. I was the whole time as with people. He says, I want to just have time to just hear and listen, to listen to my heart, to listen to God's heart. I thought that was so cool. Having a fear of getting ahead of God. Anybody know what that means? Having a fear of, of running out ahead of God and then finding out God's not following you? That's a sign of really wanting to return and rest and to find God's quietness and confidence in Him, quiet confidence. And then the last one I, I thought about was connecting with other people, realizing, hey, God made other people different from me because they have something I need, and I have something they need. That's why we're all so different. So 
because God doesn't want anybody to have the whole market share of anything. He made us to have strengths, but he made us to have gaps so that we would need one another to be interdependent. And that's part of why we're gathering together and sharing together today a little bit. And the fourth thing that God says to us is, I've given you a new identity, a spirit indwelt son or daughter. When you look at yourself this morning, don't just think of yourself as, I'm just a a Christian. I'm just a believer in Jesus. Think of yourself as, I am a son. I am a daughter of the living God. In 1 John, the apostle says, we are now, God has made us his sons and daughters. And it's an incredible thing. Do you think of yourself that way? That you actually have the spirit of the living God inside of you, living in you, and you can commune with him as you go about your day, talking to him and listening to him as he's in you. We so often think of God as being way out there, but he's not. He's right here. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says, verse 7, We are like fragile clay jars containing a great treasure. This makes it clear that this great power in us is not from us, not from ourselves, it's from God. So look at your neighbor and say, did you know you're a cracked pot? That's what a fragile clay vessel is. It's a cracked pot. <laughs> but it's, then look at them and say, but it's got a great, you've got a great treasure in you. You've got a great treasure in you. Isn't that amazing? So what is the treasure that's in us? Yeah, the Spirit of God. He lives and dwells in us. And why are we like a, a clay vessel, like a cracked pot? What's the purpose of that? Yeah, we are all broken. And what, is, what does God get out of it? He puts his treasure in this broken clay pot. What does he get out of it? He makes us whole again, yeah. yeah. When he makes us whole again, Who gets the credit and the glory? Is it us because we crack pots made ourselves without cracks? No. God gets glory when he uses people like you and me. In fact, I don't know about you, but people should say about you when they see your life, wow, I'm amazed at how that person uh, is able to live life because they've been through so much adversity. And yet they have a smile on their face. They have joy in their heart. They have peace. And you, and you can say, it's not from me, it's from him. It's from the treasure inside me, right? Wow. So this whole process is not easy, okay? It's not easy at all. It's a hard process because we are, we are hard. We have hard ground in us that God has to break up. Years and years and generations of being strong, self-sufficient, independent people. How many of us are from good German or Russian or Scandinavian stock in here? Yeah, I thought so. Most of us, and that's me too. Celtic, yeah. Celtic, the Scots-Irish, oh man. English, yeah. You know, that's just, we're, we're from generations of strong-minded, self-sufficient people. We wouldn't have survived if we weren't strong. But that that very strength can also be a problem for us when we need to be able to be weak with our loved ones, when we need to be able to be transparent, when we need to not just be self-sufficient but ask somebody else for help. Some of you know a gentleman, older guy named Butch Abold. How many people know Butch Abold? Anybody? A few people, yeah. He's a Linda Abold's husband, and he is a, I think he's around 80 now, and he was a horse breaker. He broke horses for a lot of different ranches. He would take wild horses, broncos, and he would turn them into rideable, wonderful work horses. 
He did that for years and years and years and years and years. Now he's, his body is too frail to do it anymore, but he loved doing it. I've had some great conversations with Butch. He loves Jesus too. And um, so what is the purpose of breaking a wild horse? Yeah, so it'll do what you want him to do. Sersha, what do you think? You work with the horses. Why do, you, why do they break horses? Yeah. <laughs> say it aloud, Jennifer. What did she say? They don't kill you. Yeah. Think about that. You break a wild horse so you can work with it. So it'll do what you need it to do. So it'll become uh, effective. It'll be, it'll, it won't kill you. It won't bite you. I got bit by a horse once. That is a horrible thing to happen to anybody. It really, really hurt. So when a, when a guy breaks a bronco, then it becomes usable. You know, we, we sometimes get up in arms. We think about God wants to break us. But we have to think in different terms. The master wants us to be usable. He wants us to be effective. He wants us to be moldable. He wants us to work with him and flow with him in the great things that he's doing in this earth. But if we are unbreakable, we're rebellious, we are resistant, can he use us? No, we're just like a, a wild horse. So when you think about God using you, ask this question. Is there anything hard and resistant in me that needs breaking? Is there anything hard and resistant in me that needs breaking? I just want to pray real quick. God, I just ask you to open our eyes and our hearts to see is there any way that we are resisting you? That we are basically saying, no, I don't trust you. Even though you made me and you know me better than anybody else, Lord, I just don't trust you. I want to do my own thing. Lord, help us to surrender and to realize that real life and real satisfaction and real joy will never be ours until we surrender to the one who made us the one who created us, the one who knows us best and knows what best we were created for. Help us, Lord, to trust you and to surrender to you and yield to your hand in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to close with just talking about some ways that we can move from self-strength to being okay with being weak and starting to really experience the, the uh, strength of God. The first thing is we have to accept that this is a process. It's not going to happen right real quick. And uh, we have to stay with it. And when we fall down, we have to be willing to get up. There's an old song we used to sing. We fall down, we get up. We fall down, we get up. Saint is just a sinner who fell down and got up. Love that song. Philippians 4, the Apostle Paul tells us, I have learned, which means over a period of time, how to be content with whatever circumstances I'm in. I know how to live on almost nothing and with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or an empty one, with plenty or little. I've learned I can do everything with Christ who gives me strength. Wow. Secondly, we have to realize that God's going to test you to show you how you're doing in this process. So when you hit a wall, don't get mad. Go, all right, God, you're showing me how far I've come and what I still need to do, how I need to move forward. Third, we have to increase our awareness of how strong and caring God is and that he's on our side. We need to meditate on those scriptures like we read in Isaiah 40, 30, that he wants to be the one that causes us to soar on wings like eagles. He wants to be our strength. And He is the God who nobody can overcome Him. What He wants to do, nobody can stop. So we need to meditate on verses that show God how, how show us how big our God is. And then the last one is we need to walk with another brother or sister who's going through this journey. That will help us. Because they'll help us identify when we're 
being independent, self-sufficient, and self-strong and help us to move away from that. So who in your life is a brother or sister that you are walking with that will help you in your spiritual journey? Is there anybody you can talk to about this? It's really, really important. So as we close, again, in your little group, I'm going to leave you guys with this. We're going to make room for people to pray at the end, though. I'm going to play a song in a sec. In your little group, I want you to do four things. Admit your human weakness. Psalm 62, David said, Have compassion on me, Lord, for I am weak. Glory in your weakness. In other words, thank God, Lord, thank you that I, I'm stuck here and I need you, or whatever it is. The third thing is confess that God is strong and God cares. Philippians 1.6, Paul says, I'm certain that God who began this good work in you is going to keep doing it until Jesus comes back, basically. And then the last thing is pray for one another. Pray for one another, just briefly. Say, Jesus, help this person with this issue. Okay? So, Lord, help these people as they go with it. Go ahead and meet with your people and, and talk about these things, and I'm going to play a song, and we'll be done. When I'm weak, you are strong. When I'm lost, you carry on. When I'm broken, you are there. When I'm weak, you are strong. When I'm lost, you lead me on. When I'm broken, you are there. of my faith giver of all life giver of all life when I'm weak you are strong when I'm lost you lead me on when I'm broken you are here when I'm weak strong. When I'm lost, you lead me on. When I'm broken, you are here. You are the Lord, the ruler of my life, the master of my faith, the giver of all life, yeah. The giver of all Okay, I'm going to close in prayer, and then if someone desires to be prayed for this morning, whatever your need would be, physical, emotional, uh, whatever, you want to pray that you can experience the strength of God and not be so self-controlling and strong in yourself, we'd love to pray with you. So let's go to the Lord. Gracious God, thank you so much for your help this morning. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you, Lord, that you know us so well. You provide your spirit in us to help us. Lord, help us to humble ourselves before you and to let go of having to be in control and be strong and be able to rest and be weak with you. Lord, help us experience the strength that your spirit gives. Lord, thank you for those, those people in the Bible that exemplify this, like Jacob and the Apostle Paul. Lord, help us to take home some things today that we can wrestle with this week and grow deeper in you and trust in you. I just thank you for each one that's here today and ask that you would 
bless us as we go. Thank you for the increase in relationship as we've gotten to know some people better. And we just thank you for this morning. And bless each visitor that came, God, and encourage them today, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Have an awesome afternoon.